So good morning. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. Present the link between mathematics and acoustics. Um, as always, this is of course some joint work with a lot of other people. And after hearing John's talk yesterday, I decided it might be a nice introduction to also uh, introduce my institute a bit. Because it looks a bit more like with the no genus. Okay. So the Acoustics Research Institute is an institute of the Academy of Sciences in Vienna, which means we don't have any teaching duties, only scientific research. So there's a difference right at the beginning. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> which is nice. Yeah, but, yeah. And so um, our goal is some um, interdisciplinary research in acoustics. We want to integrate set acoustics, phonetics, speech sciences, computational physics, and everything based on the strong mathematical. Right? Yeah. And the marketing words are excellence or synergy, so which means by having different people from different uh, disciplines working together, we get some new ideas, new uh, research questions, and also new models and algorithms. And well, currently we're about uh, 32 employees in Vienna, quite an international bunch. And probably what I don't have to explain here, but more for the applied people, what is the advantage of a strong mathematical background? The advantage is, of course, well, first, we, what we want to do is we want to integrate mathematics, signal processing, and education. We do application-oriented mathematics, which means we also do some abstract nonsense, but always with uh, some motivation from the uh, By doing this, this gives a really nice background for interdisciplinary research. Um, and as I said before, by having people with different scientific backgrounds, with different research interests, with this different research questions and methodologies, uh, we get the very nice new viewpoints on different uh, questions. And so for the mathematician, we get new interesting mathematical questions. And for the applied sciences, for the applied scientists, we get new models, new methods, and particular methods which are really rigorously described, where the influence of the parameters can be well controlled. And so more, it's all also often more easy to, to extend those models. So normally in the sciences, uh, how should we say it in the polite way, heuristic models are used, which are not very well described normally. And so by getting mathematical back, uh, viewpoint on it, this can kind of <laughs> What I want to present here is how to link frame theory with the, with the human theory. So the overview is uh, I already presented a bit about the uh, ARI. I will talk a bit about frame theory. Um, in particular, how this can be used to improve some empirical representations. Um, I'm going to talk about multipliers, the mathematical background, but also how this viewpoint helps in application. And then so, <clears throat> well, that's the spectrum, right? So the color codes, the amplitude, the energy, and the coefficient, this is time frequency. And let's listen to it, hopefully. Uh, and it's nice to read. So you have some vertical structures here, which is the drums, some parallel structures, and the structure is the keyboard. And then there's the, the singer's voice. So it's nice to follow it. So let's try if you can do it. Okay, so the mathematical background for that is uh, the short time full transformation, which is uh, you take a window G, you shift it in time, multiply it with the signal F, and then do a full transformation. For this continuous transform, the inverse is quite easy, and also for the let's say, finite dimensional discrete short time full transformation, uh, the inversion is easy. But uh, in particular for implementations, for applications, you don't want to do, deal with continuous transforms and you don't want to deal with a lot of uh, sample points. So you look at the sample version of it, the Gala transform. So you take the window G and shift it in time and frequency, but on a sample grid. And the other uh, question is when is perfect construction possible? 
And this is, of course, the case if this system forms a frame. I'm, I'm proud that I can put the frame definition here. Um, so what is a frame? A frame, well, most of you know. So this means a, a sequence psi k is a frame. This is in the form of this field. What this means is that the coefficients and L descriptions uh, energy-wise are bound for above and from below. And this means that the transform is bounded and bounded. And bounded. Again, some marketing. So frame theory is not only a beautiful abstract mathematical setting, where frames are generalization phases and can be able to complete and allow redundant representations. And they are very active and interesting field of research, mathematics stuff. They are also interesting for applications. First, they offer much more freedom than, for example, basis thing. Finding constructing frames can be easier, faster, and some some a priori uh, uh, properties you would like to have of the transform. Some advantageous side constraints are certainly uh, sometimes only possible for frames of the basis. For example, for the GABA transforms have nice have frequency concentration. This is only possible with frames. But contrary to other uh, constructions in single processing, for example, by using frames, you always have perfect construction. By using the sort of canonical dual frame, where you apply the frame of the inverse frame of the to the frame, but then you can have this construction. This is not always numerically very fast, but using iterative approaches, you <coughs> can always calculate. Okay, so how can how can this freedom? used, for example, for time frequency representations. So one, <coughs> let's say, one, one limitation of the standard GABA uh, transform of standard GABA analysis is you fix a window. You fix a window for your whole, whole time frequency transform. And uh, the, the, the quality of the representation highly depends on this window. And there could be different parts of your signal which would be different uh, representation. So, for example, if you look at the, this is the Jokmanspiel signal. Signal for. So you have you have a text and you have some harmonic structures. So, okay, if you choose a if you choose a long window, of course you can uh, represent the harmonic parts, the sinus overputs. Same total part as well, but the effects you can. If you take a, a small window, you can represent the, the text, the temporal structure very well, but the symbolic structure is not very well represented. Okay, what could you do about it? Well, the easy approach is, of course, use a time variant window. And so, um, not fixing the window over the whole time, but using a time variant window, you get a representation of this, of the same signal. And you see it's, well, both components are rather valuable. Okay, and how, how is this defined? Well, in a very natural way. So instead of using a fixed G, you, you use a G that this is dependent on the te temporal variable. You use a, a hop size, a temporal sampling variable, which is also depending on this A, and also the the frequency sampling step is also depending on the, on the time. But we still have a regular structure in the for, for each for each window, you still have a regular structure in the frequency, so this allows fast implementation with the you can do a very analog uh, construction on the frequency side by doing the same on the frequency side. And with it with that you get a nice way to implement, for example, redundant data frames or get an invertible constituted for so let's look at the toy example for that. So you can uh, windows chosen like that, which you probably would never do in the condition, but some trying windows, and then you do the frequency sampling according to this scheme. Let's see, okay, in the frequency it's a regular structure. Okay. Uh, you can still use frame theory, and for example, using frame theory, this allows you a very efficient way to calculate dual in the so-called painless case, like in the regular other uh, case. And this is with the windows chain are completely supported within this interval, such that the length of this interval is smaller than one divided by dpn, where dpn is the frequency sampling. 
then the system forms a frame with an all of this involvement for field. And in this case, the canonical dual is just a re weighted. Uh, in this case, it's, yeah. so this, the frame operator is just a diagonal matrix of diagonal operators, and you get the dual just by removing the uh, window. Okay, so another example is a third scene. And again, you see, so for for white window, the beginning of the bird song is not well represented. Represented for the narrow window, the end is not well represented. If you choose the window nicely, in this case manually, uh, you get a nice representation over the whole sample. So, and uh, how can this be used, for example, for some kind of frequency representation that is fitted to the human hearing, to the human auditory perception? Well, by, so psychoacoustics, psychoacousticians invested quite some time to measure the frequency scale of the human uh, hearing system, and also the, the, the bandwidth of the filters. Well, the human hearing system is uh, completely nonlinear, but you can get the uh, approximation of it by using some auditory filters. And this is uh, the scale you can use. So in the beginning, it's more or less linear, and in the end, it's more, more or less logarithm. So you can, uh, if you can put this, so do a non-stationary Gabba transform on the frequency side, enter this information you get from psychoacoustics, and you get a representation which looks like this, which is in the low frequency, it's a Gabba transform. In the high frequency, it's more or less a wavelet transform. And in between, there's something else. Uh, but contrary to other constructions, so for example, there's, there's the gamma tone representation, which is also a filter bank, which is adapted to the human hearing, um, which looks rather similar to this one. But here, because we rely on frame theory, we get the perfect reconstruction. The reconstruction error in this case is just the numerical error. Um, maybe some, some other advertisement. Uh, there is the large time frequency analysis toolbox, box, which is an open source toolbox for MATLAB and Octave with some code in there. It's well documented and, and publicly available. And so if you're interested in using some kind of frequency analysis, you could have worked there. There's a new version coming up, 2.0, where some wavelets are included. Earlets are included. The earlets are called earlets because this scale is called the EAP scale. Uh, and there is a, now an object-oriented uh, way to treat frames. So in your code, you can just put frame analysis and frame synthesis, and then choose your frame accordingly. OK. So the field the bank on the frequency side will be this. The, the way is because you, we have chosen the, the autonom of the, of the uh, concept. And if you look at the dual, if the economical dual it can look like this. So similar, but not, not the same. Because we will be based on frame theory, it's easy to copy it. In this case, because we, were, we, we have used the Gaussian atom, we have to use some. Of okay. So, another abstract focus uh, of my work is the uh, concept of frame and the concept is really easy to explain. What is a multiplier? Uh, well, we do some analysis with, with, with a chip of frame. We do a multiplication with a fixed symbol, and then we do a symbol. But interestingly, this is a concept which is quite important for a lot of uh, scientific disciplines. So for mathematics, of course, it's used for the diagonalization of operations. The theorem is a theorem about multiplies. In physics, they, they are linked between the classical mechanics and quantum mechanics. So they are the point, they, are, they can be seen as this composition. In signal processing, uh, they are particular way to implement time bearing filters. And in acoustics, of course, they have some implementation, uh, some applications where those time bearing fri time frequency filters, those time bearing filters are applied in several fields, for example, in computational auditory scene analysis, where they try to pick out particular auditory option objects out of the out of the Again, it's easy to, to demonstrate what the multiplier does. So this is a audio file you that you Listen to. And now let's so okay. So now we know what, what the coefficients are. So 
So this is drums, this is the singer's voice, those are the keyboard. So let's have a naive approach of how we, we now want to erase the singer. So we want to erase this one. So what we do is we manually, we think, okay, this is an instrument the singer's voice lift in effect. We, can, we multiply this by this to a synthesis and get this. And if we listen to it, <coughs> Well, it was a naive approach, um, <laughs> but it is a so it is a nice concept, an easy concept with some nice mathematical uh, questions arising. But to apply it in acoustics, you still need some 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 more thought on what would be good way to apply. Okay, so on the mathematical uh, side, we we defined the stream as I said before. Okay, so what do you do? You, you, you start with two frames, like in uh, You do an analysis with one of the frames to a multiplication with the symbol MK, and then do a synthesis with another. Um, and we, we investigated some of the, some of the mathematical, theoretical properties of those operators. For example, we looked a lot into the inevitability of such multipliers, just as an example of a theorem. Uh, with this one, so if you if you do a multiplier with of normal basis, uh, the inverse of this multiplier is certainly you just invert the symbol. Then you get the inverse. Um, what is interesting, you can do the same for the random frames too. So let's say for these spaces, um, you it's known that you just have to invert the symbol and then use the biorthogonal uh, sequences and flip the rows of the two. You can do the same for redundant frames by using by inverting the symbol using a particular uh, dual of the frame side and any dual of the frame five, and then you get the inverse of the multiplier. You have to multiply them. <coughs> and interestingly, this particular dual is unique. Okay, so uh, how can this help in applications? Or rather, so the, abstract, the real abstract results don't help in the acoustical applications, but the mathematical viewpoint of it and the mathematical knowledge about the concept help. So I'll talk about perceptual spots. So anybody of you or most of you probably know what an MP3 is, and most of you probably have an MP3 player. An MP3 is an encoding decoding scheme in the MP1, MP3, layer 3, uh, MP1, MP2, layer 3 standard. It uses a lot of signal processing algorithm, but also uses a model for the psychoacoustical masking. And masking is the, is the effect that uh, if human, humans listen to certain sounds, if you have two, two parts of the sound, and they're near to each other in time, in frequency or in time frequency, under certain conditions, you only hear one of them. So which means the other one is inaudible. You can just ignore it. And this is what uh, we do with the so-called irrelevant filter where we want to search and delete those inaudible, those masked, those irrelevant components out of the representation. So uh, for quite some time, in, we had an implementation of such a, of such a model, which is based on the frequency mask <coughs> model. Um, and well, you can listen to it, it's a rather long. Then you can apply this, this uh, algorithm where we have, and we, I don't know if you see it well, some of the components are removed. Those are the components where our model says, say, says that they are inaudible. But, but what's interesting and what I also always like to play is those components you normally don't, don't hear if you listen to this song. So this is the part you normally cannot hear. Um, Maybe you think, okay, in this time frequency representation, of course, but if you look at the picture, I might have only re uh, removed the small, the small components. Well, not really. It's really an adaptive procedure. So if you look at the, one of the slices and one of the spectral, one of the spectra, and you look at this region, and this is the original signal, and this is the uh, filtered one, you see that not only the small components are removed, but it really depends on your on your uh, local on the local uh, properties of the signal. And uh, 
it's a simple model which is which is uh, based on the let's say on the excitation pattern in the in the year. So you have a membrane in there. You have some one single components. The component is not only exciting one of the nerve cells, but a whole bunch of it. A simple model for, model for this is using a triangular uh, function for that on a park scale or in this uh, EUP scale. And then what we do is okay, you have a model for this excitation. We uh, take the one slice in the perfective plant, take this triangular and uh, do convolution, and then we get the line, which is a we, which we use as a threshold function, and then everything which is above this threshold is kept. And um, this can be seen as a uh, let's say as an adaptive data frame multiplier. So this means okay, we start off with a signal. From the signal, we calculate the symbol. What to well, what to keep and what to throw away, and then we do just do a multiplication. So you multiply the hundreds, you see the symbol, and then you get the result. Okay, this is let's say the model is no, the algorithm is quite old. Only recently we have based it on the on some uh, on new viewpoint, and of course on new uh, we also did some new psychological. <coughs> Um, evaluation and now what we what we, what we do now in the next couple years we want to we want to extend it first we want to base it on the on the EOP lets because we developed the EOP lets to have a country and linear perfectly vertical complete representation which is uh, linked to human perception and also in the past few years we did a lot on the time frequency masking we, did, we, we had a lot of such acoustical experiments on time frequency masking. So in the past, uh, masking were, uh, was investigated for, for masking the temporal domain or masking the frequency domain, but uh, there were nearly no data on how the masking evolved in the country. So we, what we did is we put some portions, put some position in the country, put some other portions around it, and then measured. Uh, well, which, what is the threshold for the other ones to be audible? So this, um, let's say, masking curve in the uh, Yeah, so what we want to do with it is we want to have a new neural lens approach. But uh, in the current project, which only started rather recently, we want to see if we can use it really for some improved audio codes to improve some new uh, audio code. And probably the last slide is very, very recent work. So if anybody of you uh, is planning to go to the ICRASP in Florence in the next month, or month, this is what is going to be presented. So of course, uh, so we call the, the irrelevance approach, we call the perceptual bus. But of course, there's bus here, it's comprehensive. So how can we link these two things? And uh, what we did is uh, uh, Easy, let's say. So what we, we use the signal, uh, we few thousand um, frequency samples, the frequency atoms, use the standard uh, orthogonal, orthogonal natural pursuit um, algorithm for that, which reduced the number of atoms in this case to 400 atoms. And then by using this by using this kernel, we we looked at of those remaining atoms, which of the atoms are masks by the other ones, and still we can put the roof in another second. Well, yeah, I think that's it. So, uh, well, frame theory is uh, not only a very beautiful aspect, it's important for applications, and in particular, you can see some links of mathematics and people frame theory to human hearing, to research and study. Well, thank you. I have, mm, I, I would have to look it up for a big uh, No, but uh, yeah. First of all, a great talk. Uh, there was, I'm not sure if you're aware, there was a wave laboratory modeling yes. pattern. And uh, at the time, we also used frame theory for both the part of it. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, we, we had a look at that. Uh, so. <coughs> That's quite old. You 
Yes. Yeah. And as far as I remember, one of the one of the important questions was was to get causal filters. Was to do what? To have causal filters, right? Which Which is a filter yes, we, we don't care about this. Well, and uh, because we have the non-station recovery control, it was a natural thing to see if we can. Well, yeah, no, it's a different application. Yes. There's a mathematical description of the sounds that are pleasing to the ear. Uh, <laughs> how much time do you give? Uh, no. No, uh, there's even no matter. So, there are a lot of algorithms, a lot of models of what we can hear from the sound. But even those are not completely described. Even those, there's still all work to do there. So, if you go one step further, if you want to see what is pleasing to us, well, let's see. Give me a few hundred years and maybe that. <laughs> maybe. Is, is there any indication that the human visual system has similar sorts of conflict areas that you might be able to compress the uh, I'm sorry? Is, is there any reason to suspect that the human visual system has the same kind of conflict areas that you might be able to compress against? 